I am really looking forward to more studies coming out about this, including some from my own lab with the human study we have going on now. This is anecdotal, but I will state it a bit emphatically because the evidence is just so convincing. I have seen people cut their uric acid levels in half. Um, so to go from problematic levels to very good levels within just weeks by doing like they're, they're ketogenic, they're kind of carnivore consumers or very low carb. And they just start taking 10 to 20 grams of allulose per day. And their uric acid just gets corrected like that. The, 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 phys, the biochemistry of it is probably because uric acid is fructose's twin. It has literally one single carbon is flipped at the third, at the third carbon, it has one little unit that is flipped down. So it's what's called an epimer in chemistry yep. terms. But because of its similarity, it's a direct competition for fructose. And the consequences of this mean that fructose metabolism plummets and thus uric acid synthesis plummets as well. So that is something I um, see really getting evidence to support in the near future, but the anecdotal evidence is incredibly compelling. Now, full disclosure, I am an advisor for a company called RX Sugar, but if I will say it shamelessly, if someone's interested in some allulose products, just check out RX Sugar. The only reason I'm affiliated with them at all is because their allulose products are just so well done. I do think it is discouraging though, Ken, just to add on to what you just said, it seems like any time there can be an article that vilifies an alternative to sugar, boy, it makes the headlines. Just like any time there's even a whiff of evidence that red meat is bad from all these horrible correlational studies, boy, it makes every headline. And and I, I hope people are increasingly skeptical of what mainstream media outlets are trying to tell us with regards to perhaps all kinds of things, but certainly diet. Um, so yeah, it's, it's discouraging. Um, anytime, uh, the, this evidence comes out and there's always substantial flaws with the way the data are interpreted. Um, so my favorite is allulose. That is the one I use the most readily and the one that we use for baking. That's the one that the kids indulge in. Um, that's what I want to stock the pantry with by way of indulgences. And thankfully, allulose is growing in its use across a, a variety of products. So it's just getting easier and easier to want to default to it. Other sweeteners that I like are um, stevia. I like stevia, monk fruit extract. Um, and to be honest, I, this is probably going to ruffle some feathers. Yes, even aspartame. I think the aspartame is a fairly benign, pretty darn benign. It just gets converted into amino acids, for goodness sakes. Um, unless someone has a known genetic defect in the ability to metabolize aspartame, which is tested for at birth, then I don't believe there's any reason to be worried about it. Now, on the other end, the ones that I'm the most um, wary of are probably some of those sugar alcohols that I mentioned um, early on. Um, the evidence on sucralose is a little um, a little murky. That one is sort of to be determined the degree to which it is capable of you know causing some problems across the blood brain barrier or etc. But uh, until that is really settled on, you know the jury's out there. But in the meantime, I'd really point a finger and try to avoid some of those sugar alcohols. I, I do, I, I do. I absolutely think that we need to be mindful of behaviors where we are. Um, leading ourselves into constantly into, I guess, a form of disordered eating where we feel like we have to, it's a reward always at every moment, especially as a parent, where everything has to end with something sweet. That's not, I just don't think that's the case. Now, Ken, if you'll allow me, someone in my community asked about the study that showed erythritol and blood clotting. That was a study, of course, that made headlines about six to eight months ago. Right. The, yeah, great, the great flaw with that study while it was human, they found that people with higher erythritol levels in their blood had higher risk of blood clots. One of the great problems with that study was the absolute failure to acknowledge that erythritol is actually a molecule that can be endogenously made. So our own bodies can actually make erythritol yep. from glucose. Yep. And so one of the great confounding variables in that study, and boy, did it make headlines, is the fact that people with hyperglycemia or even type 2 diabetes, which is the greatest risk of heart disease, that's the greatest contributor to heart disease, type 2 diabetes, that that's a huge confounding variable, that these people who are hyperglycemic probably have a lot of other things going on, including insulin resistance, 
And while erythritol was positively correlated, we have to remember that in that study, the great flaw was that it could not prove causality. It's just another instance of correlational evidence being mistaken as causality. And again, in this case, to really put a fine point on it, chronically elevated glucose will start to get converted into erythritol. Um, that's not the only molecule, by the way, even sorbitol. There are a handful of molecules that are created by elevated levels of glucose, thus creating, as I've stated already, a pretty huge confounding variable in that study.